does whole life insurance actually work? In this video, we are going to look at a policy that was started back in 2016. So we've got a couple of years behind it now, uh, entering policy year seven. We can see what was originally illustrated how it has performed, particularly in a declining interest rate environment. So this policy was started by uh, someone who has become a friend of mine over the years. Initials are GP without disclosing any confidential information. He started a policy with one of the major mutual companies. We looked at a couple of different companies. He selected Mass Mutual. He also selected a survivorship whole life insurance policy. So the survivorship policy, what a survivorship policy is, it is, it is one policy on two individuals. So it was on him and his wife. Now with a survivorship policy, the death benefit is not paid out until both individuals die. So if he dies, his wife does not receive the death benefit. She'll have access to the cash value. She can continue to fund the policy, use it however she wants. However, the death benefit is not paid out until both individuals pass. So it's always important to be aware of that. Now with that said, a survivorship policy, because the death benefit's not paid out until both individuals pass, as a result, the internal insurance expenses can be a little bit less than a single life policy. In summary, I can see a little bit stronger cash value performance as a result, which is nice. Just when I look at the overall internal rate of return, he was laser focused on maximum cash value. This was a nice option. It was also a nice option for him with what he was trying to do from a retirement planning standpoint. We looked at, we'll call it a financial map or financial outline we created showing here's what things look like on the accumulation phase as he continues to allocate money toward other assets he had, toward the life insurance policy. Here's what it looks like as he builds his net worth up over the next several years because he's he started the policy right around the age of 50. And then here's what it looks like on the distribution phase. He can live off the interest of his assets, or he can aggressively spend down some assets that are taxable, tax deferred, paying the taxes really when he's spending the money, but he's going to aggressively spend them down, and then leave a death benefit, which is past income tax-free, to the next generation. We've got some retirement videos that really lay that entire plan out. We've got a couple of them, but that's one thing we looked at in his particular case. But the survivorship policy, was attractive to him as we looked at a number of different options and it worked out quite well just from a performance standpoint. One other thing I want to mention on this um, because we get requests for this sometimes, the MEC rules are different on this. You don't have the same seven years, the seven year test that you would have with a standard whole life insurance policy with it, or a single life whole, a single life policy, meaning a policy just on one individual. The difference is with a single life policy, if I wanted to, after the first seven years, I can cut the term rider, go reduced paid up, and I do not have to worry about a MEC occurring. With a survivorship policy, that's not the case. I don't have the same seven year test. So if I'm going to use a term rider, I need to make sure that the policy is properly funded and that term doesn't become too expensive and I run into an issue down the road. There's just a couple more things that I wanna have awareness on. Um, as a, a policy holder, but more so as an agent if I'm writing survivorship policies and the individual's interested in cash accumulation because it's a nice tool, right? It's like having a, a car with 900 horsepower, but if you don't know how to drive that thing, you're gonna run it off the cliff and then you're like, oh great, I just bought this expensive car for nothing. <laughs> Not to be that extreme, but I hope that made sense. So the plan was to fund it at $150,000 per year Initially, for the first three years, where that funding was coming from is he had received a deferred compensation plan, a payout, just for the years of service he had at a company. And he said, okay, I'd like to move the, this money over to a cash value life insurance policy. He looked very heavily at the guarantees. We looked at the guaranteed and non-guaranteed values, but he did make a comment. He said, I'm pretty much banking on the guarantees here. And he was satisfied with it based on what he saw with the guaranteed values. Now we're gonna see how it has actually performed. We're gonna look at the original plan as well based on the non-guaranteed values at that point in time. So let's take a look here. On the left, we've got the original illustration and we exported this from the actual detailed illustration that he started with. We just wanted to put things side by side, makes life a lot easier rather than paging through different illustrations. So here's the original plan, years one through three, 
$150,000 was paid into the policy, and then his plan was to gradually scale payments down. Next three years, $125,000 per year. Through year 10, or year seven through 10, $50,000 per year for a total of just over $1 million allocated to the policy. As we look at this, year one, $150,000 went into the policy. Projected cash value, $133,000. This was the original illustration. 2016, what was Mass Mutual's dividend interest rate? 7.1%. That's pretty nice, especially when we look at it today at 6%. All companies have come down as a result of the low interest rate environment. Break even point, what's highlighted in yellow here, falls when between years three and four. Break even means that he has more money in cash value than what he has paid into the product. So, year four in the projection, he paid in 575 and he's got 590. And then you've got the annual internal rate of return, which is the net growth rate on an annual basis, not the average, but just isolating what we're earning each year. Now let's look at what actually happened. You will notice he did change his funding, but before we look at that, let's look at year one. So he's paid in $150,000 in year one. Projection was 133. What actually showed up on his statement was what? $128,000 in change. Why does he have less than what was projected? The reason why is because he backdated the policy, backdated it quite a bit. So when I say quite a bit, it was over six months. If I recall properly, I can go back and look at the notes, but he backdated it somewhere between six and nine months. Why that's important to note is this policy design, he has a premium of about $15,000. That's his actual base premium. The other $135,000, is allocated toward the PUA rider. Just about all of it. There's a term rider as well, which is minimal. But call it the other 135 into PUAs. If his policy date is in July, let's assume he started the policy in January, just for the sake of simplicity. What will happen in this particular case, so if he starts the policy in July, but he backdates to January, the base premium $15,000 is applied on the policy date. So we backdated to have a policy date of January. However, the PUA payment of $135,000 is applied in July. So what that means is when the guaranteed rate and any dividends are actually applied to the policy, it's based on the date of deposit with PUA funds, not based on the policy date because they start to earn interest a little bit later. That's why I have a little bit less in value there. Good to be aware of. Does make a huge difference, but when that question pops up just with PUA payments and backdating, that's why we see the difference. So going back to the numbers now, let's take a look here. Year two, he's paid in 150. Value that was projected, 273, or value that, actually, that he actually had at the end of year two. 273 and what was projected was 274 and change. So he's not too far behind, a little over a thousand dollars behind considering he's paid in $300,000. One, he had the backdating and then two, the dividend rate came down. On the original illustration, it assumed 7.1% forever. In reality, came down 40 basis points to 6.7%. The next year, year three, what occurred? He pays in 150, total of 450. He's got $435,000 in cash value. The dividend came down again to 6.4%. If we go back to the original illustration that assumes a dividend rate of 7.1% in year three, cash value was almost $440,000. So we've got about a $4,000 delta there. This is mainly a result of the declining dividend. However, the policy is heavily weighted in PUA payments. It's got a minimal base premium. So what we see occur here, granted we have a reduction in base premium payments, we still break even when we're supposed to. 
based on the projection that is between years three and four in this particular case. So year four, he's paid in $600,000 and he has 600, he's got 607. And that was pulled directly from his annual statement, real values, same thing with the death benefit at $4.2 million. Now you'll also notice if you compare year four, what do you notice here? Cash value is less, it's $590,000. But the reason why, you may have caught this already, is in year four, what was the plan? To pay in 125. What did he actually do? He paid in 150 again. So he's paid in more. So what that means, this is invalid. <laughs> Moving forward as we use it uh, as a means to compare to what's actually happening. So let's take a look here. Year five, 2020, he's paid in $50,000. Brings his total cost basis up to 650. He's got just about 690. This was pulled from a statement. And look at this. So just measuring the growth, what he earned this particular year, 4.89%. The dividend interest rate was 6.2% that year. Next year, 2021, scaled those payments down a little bit more, $35,000. Cash value grew to just about 760. IRR was again 4.89%. Dividend rate comes down again. Now it's at 6%. What's happening here? Well, now he pays in another $35,000, which he's projected to pay this month, actually, and the cash value is projected to hit based on the present dividend rate, 833 and change. And this is something we track each year. As we tracked this actual value last year compared to this year, the difference was a couple dollars. Literally, it was like less than a hundred bucks. And it's actually about a hundred dollars more this year than what was projected last year. Now, you might say a hundred dollars, who cares? Why it's a little bit more? Dividend rate stayed the same, but there's other components behind the scenes that adjust the actual performance. You've got the insurance expenses and mortality charges. The actual dividend crediting rate makes, about, makes up about one third of your actual policy performance without getting further into the weeds. Another thing I want to hit on here is if you don't like the returns here, those are fun to look at, but at the same time, if you just say, what's my money, like what's my policy growing by, this makes it a little bit easier. So as we look at the far right, you've got that cash value growth column, and that just displays what it's growing by each year. So this year, he can say, I earned $38,000. That's what it grew by this particular year, taking last year, I was at 759, I paid in 35, and my net value is 833. So I got my 35K back, plus another $38,000 on top of it. That cash value growth column is the net growth column, meaning we're not including the payments we make as well. But we like to look at the net numbers there, very important just to provide transparency. Okay. So that's what the value looks like as time continues to pass. We can scroll down. His plan right now is to stop payments in 2031. He just emailed me the other day. He might stop earlier. Why I ran it through 2031 here is just to get the same net dollar amount in, the $1,025,000. So as we look at the overall performance, this is performing quite nicely, even considering that the dividend interest rate has come down. He's very happy with it. And this is the kind of stuff we track as the years pass. Hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Let me know if you would like to see any particular case studies or have follow-up questions on this video or any videos. And please hit the like button and subscribe for more. And as always, I hope this helps. Thanks so much. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.